It's the first morning of the new parliamentary year. Kevin Rudd has joined other lawmakers for an ecumenical prayer service. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. But the fragile pre-Copenhagen consensus on climate change has broken down. The opposition has a new head, Tony Abbott, who won the Liberal Party leadership on the eve of the last emissions trading vote by ousting his predecessor who supported the government scheme. Not that he'd utter the words in church, Abbott once described climate change as absolute crap, a view that's made him increasingly popular as the Prime Minister was forced to concede. Yeah, yeah, had a good start, mate. Well, yeah, look, it's, it's, been, it's been OK. <laughs> it's still a bit scary, but yeah. here we are. OK, see ya. See ya. Yeah. Yeah. A grassroots movement that's defiantly anti-green. Farmers gather on the lawns of Parliament House to protest against new environmental laws which prevent them from clearing their land. There's something of the spirit of America's Tea Party movement, and it quickly turns into a rally against the Rudd government's entire green agenda, including the ETS. Thank you very much for that. And it's Senator Barnaby Joyce once more who's leading the charge. The first thing they're going to bring into our parliament, the first thing for our nation they're going to do this year, is try to reintroduce the ETS. Well, I can say this, Mr Rudd, Mrs Wong, have a look outside. It's starting to come unstuck for you. I'm sorry about that. There he is, the man of the hour. For Tony Abbott, it's yet another platform to hammer the Prime Minister's proposals, something he's been doing almost constantly since Copenhagen. It's a great big tax. We don't need it. And as far as I'm concerned, our job this week is to save Australia from Mr Rudd's Great big tax. When Mr Abbott became leader, many pundits thought he was toxic. But a new poll out this very morn has shown the opposition ahead of the governing Labour Party for the first time in three years. No wonder he's got such a spring in his step. Can I just ask you about your popularity today? Does it vindicate <laughs> your tough stance on the Green Agenda? Look, um, I'm encouraged. Uh, but there's a long, hard road to tread. OK, thank you. And the path led to the first question time after the southern summer break. And the government, and I renew my question, I renew my question, does the Prime Minister have the guts to have a nationally televised debate about climate change, my direct action versus his great big tax? Yes, and let us have the debate here in the People's House. But then the Prime Minister hit back, attacking the opposition's newly unveiled policy to ditch the ETS and to rely primarily on planting thousands of trees. If you go out there and publicly say that climate change is absolute crap, what do you think people conclude when you put out a piece of paper that you're actually serious about it? That's why people don't trust the Leader of the Opposition on climate change. But a major problem for Mr Rudd is that many people no longer entirely trust the scientists either. First there was a so-called climate gate affair, where leaked emails from a climate research unit at the University of East Anglia in Britain allegedly showed that data was being manipulated. Then there's the admission of mistakes and poor sourcing in a landmark report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC and they've been conned by the IPCC, they've been conned by the leaders of the IPCC, uh, Climate Gate, Glacier Gate, Weather Gate, and ultimately people have said, I've had enough of this. And so the political wheel has turned so quickly, and I actually don't think that politicians in Australia have read it right. Watching the debate unfold has been Nick Rowley, a former Downing Street advisor who helped write the influential Stern Report, the 2006 study into the economic impact of climate change. He now runs a consultancy in Sydney advising on carbon management and sustainability. 
over the last couple of years, post, post the Stern Review, with the drought, post the Gore film, Hurricane Katrina, and other events, is that to say that you're sceptical about climate science is a bit like saying you're in favour of, uh, of fur coats or you, you know, that, that sort of thing. It's not socially acceptable. And a whole lot of really rather conservative reactionary forces in Australia suddenly now feel with a change in uh, leadership in the opposition, um, some more, um, how can one say, uh, articulate advocates for the sceptical case, coupled with some real problems in terms of the way in which the IPCC science has been presented and some real errors made by the IPCC. And of course, Climate Gate, which was a real problem. It wasn't a pretend problem, it was a real problem. Um, I think that people have thus had, get more confidence, they feel they have license to have their views both articulated publicly, but also they feel more comfortable uh, in, in the views that they've got. And I think that's certainly occurred. In drought-stricken Sydney, it's been the wettest February for the past eight years. For supporters of the Green Agenda at the moment, when it rains, it pours. But John Connor of the Climate Institute says the core science is strong. And while the polling numbers have shifted, there's still solid support for the need to tackle climate change. Well, it's still the majority view. It's no time to relax at all, and it's very important that we come back and actually uh, 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 really make people understand that all of these claims about the science collapsing is absolute nonsense. Not the core science hasn't had a dent put in it. There's certainly um, uh, been some problems with process, but it's gate gate out there. All these uh, Amazon gates, Africa gates, climate gates. When, when what we're confident is that the science will still be there and, and sustain those debates, and that will re-emerge. Uh, we're also confident that people will begin to understand that around the world, other countries are getting on with the job, particularly Asian economies are investing heavily in clean energy and clean technologies. And they're not doing that just out of altruism, they're doing it because they see the real opportunities in the 21st century economy being in these technologies. Australia is a small, uh, well-educated, uh, developed economy in a region where unless this region, being Southeast Asia and Asia, actually delinks energy growth from economic growth and emissions growth, then the climate problem will not be solved. And Australia, being the country it is, that can really innovate, um, that it can innovate in this whole space of new green infrastructure and green technology and really show the way for this region in how we can actually maintain economic growth grow the Australian economy and also reduce emissions both here and in the region. Resplendent in his speedos, what the locals call budgie smugglers. This is Tony Abbott living the Australian dream. He's a smart enough politician to understand that it would be hard to win an election here advocating outright climate change scepticism. Without any kind of response to global warming, he'd appear even more naked before the electorate. But he's been buoyed in the polls by turning the environmental debate into an economic debate. This is really Tony Abbott's position. He's making it about the economy. It's not simply about the environment, but also about the economy. And for a lot of Labor's, the Labor Party's working class base, or lower middle class base, that are mortgaged to the hilt, um, being reminded of the higher costs of living under an ETS, I think is a politically wise move on the opposition's part. As this photo opportunity inadvertently suggests, Tony Abbott faces a gruelling uphill struggle. It's me, you here. Kevin Rudd remains personally popular. No first-term Prime Minister has been ditched since the Depression. And the need for some kind of action on global warming remains, for now, a majority view. But in this post-Copenhagen phase, Australia is witnessing a new politics of climate change and in defiance of the prevailing wisdom, it's put a wind at the new opposition leader's back. I think if the government tries to run an election on climate, then they do so at their peril. Tony Abbott's appeal, it's not a case to do nothing on climate change, it's a case for not doing something stupid and a unilateral action, that is an Australian ETS in a post-Copenhagen world, would be stupid. It would be economic pain for no environmental gain. Look, it's a very high risk strategy uh, to run a climate, climate denier strategy here in, in Australia. Uh, and I think, because I think Australians actually want action, they're also worried about the fact that we do have one of the most polluting and inefficient economies in the Western world and that opportunities are going to be taken elsewhere. So it's a high risk strategy to take, 
take that to the Australian public, uh, who, uh, by a very significant majority, believe that global warming is happening. The bill creating the emissions trading scheme is still stalled in the Australian Parliament without any chance of passage. But don't expect Kevin Rudd to make its failure the defining issue in the forthcoming national election. The prospect of fighting a climate change election may have been attractive prior to Copenhagen, but that was before the rise of Australia's sceptics.